right, we are live for our session for Sound for Video. It is the 18th of July, 2016. And uh, joining us here today, we have Mark Latani. Did I say that right, Mark? <laughs> We're not sure. He's still work, working on sound there. All right. Um, I did have one question that came in today. I wanted to address that first. And that was, uh, let me just pull that up here. Uh, here we go. From Kevin Snyman. And Kevin said, Curtis, maybe you could talk through any potential differences in the audio approach and setup for a documentary shoot versus narrative film. And uh, I think that's a really good question. And in fact, um, what's interesting about that question is that the, the short film that I worked on this weekend with a friend, um, sort of a passion project. Let me just kind of give you some background on that because I think it um, in, is instructive in terms of uh, answering that question. But the the thing I worked on this weekend was a, was a passion project. It was my friend's project. Um, he is a, he's definitely more of a um, director of photography than I am. I'm going to, suddenly the sun is shining right in. I'm going to just close the drape here. <laughs> Hopefully that mellows it out a little bit. Okay. Um, so yeah, so he's a little bit more of a director of photography than I am. And he um, needed someone to do sound because he, in the past when he's done his projects, he's been kind of the only guy and he maybe brought along a couple of friends and the friends did the best that they could in terms of, you know, following directions. But, um, he wanted to, to kind of improve his, uh, overall production value. So he invited me to come along and help out with sound. So I actually did help with sound, not only sound, but, um, also, helped a little bit on gaffing in terms of getting the lighting all set up and things of that nature. We'll come back to that if we have time. But um, the the whole premise was it's sort of, he's just putting together a, a short piece. It's probably gonna be five to 10 minutes max. And um, what the piece is about is a, a local guitar maker here. Um, actually, I live actually up in the mountains, <laughs> but um, he, the, the guitar maker and actually my friend Levi live down in the, in Salt Lake Valley. So in Salt Lake, Utah area. And, uh, the guitar maker has been making guitars for decades from what I can gather. And, uh, now one second lighting's really bad. Okay, we're going to go with that instead. <laughs> Much better. Um, so the guitarist's name is Joel Noland, and uh, he was actually, as a teenager, when he was in ninth grade, um, he was diagnosed with a condition called AS, and I don't remember exactly what that stands for, but in, a, in essence, it's like, it's, it's a form of early onset arthritis, and so it generally affects people's spine, and... Uh, they experienced a, a fair bit of pain, but he first noticed the symptoms when he was in ninth grade and was diagnosed later in ninth grade. And uh, so he, it's kind of an interesting story because then he ended up um, being someone who was very, very involved in terms of, you know, very, a lot of physical activity, playing football, so on and so forth. But then um, learned, I think from his father, how to build things you know, building stuff with his hands and then eventually went into furniture making and then into guitar making, which kind of actually started as a hobby, but ended up working out for him. So in any case, that's the backstory. Um, in terms of pre-production, my friend Levi, uh, we had gone back and forth several times. He, he actually, um, I love working with him because he likes to plan ahead, <laughs> um, but he's also very creative and spontaneous at the same time. But he did want to have a pre-production meeting with Joel, the guitarist, and uh, just go over to his home where we were going to shoot um, because he has his workshop in the basement of his home. And uh, unfortunately, we went back and forth. We just couldn't work out a time where all of us could meet. So Levi ended up going and meeting with Joel on his own. So I didn't end up getting to go to the pre-production meeting. Um, but we talked a little bit beforehand and I was able to kind of ask some questions about what he was looking for, what the kind of the format of the film was going to be. It was, this is, this is, I think really uh, it's best to characterize this as a documentary, um, but it's a little bit more like a narrative from the standpoint that it was very simple in terms of sound. Um, it was an interview and then capturing um, a bunch of sh footage of the guitar maker actually working at his craft. And so capturing that sound. And 
pretty straightforward. And fortunately, because again, it was a sitting interview, I could boom a microphone with no problem, didn't have to worry about lavaliers. And uh, then I also boomed for all of those, the, um, the workshop clips that we gathered as well. Um, so that was pretty straightforward. Did a little bit of Foley. Um, so it was a pretty straightforward piece, but there were a couple of things that um, I learned. First of all, this is, as I'm just sort of, um, I guess I should take a step back. So for me, um, doing sound up until this point, until very recently, was more about me providing the sound for my own projects doing corporate video. And um, so I was the camera operator and the sound guy. <laughs> and so this is my second time doing a project where I was a dedicated sound guy and could focus all of my efforts on that. And so I felt myself, I felt a lot more prepared. Um, we had talked a few weeks back about all the mistakes I made on the first one. <laughs> so this time I felt a lot more prepared. Some of the things that um, we learned this time, I brought along those sound blankets and we ended up using both. I, I only brought two and that ended up being plenty for the, the particular location we were shooting at. One of them actually, we ended up, we ended up throwing one on the floor. There was a tile floor. Um, we had hit the um, Joel seated in a chair in his sort of front room, living room, which was carpeted. And then behind him, um, was sort of a kind of an entryway and a kitchen and a dining room. And so it had a tile floor. And so we threw one of the sound blankets out over the floor. That helped a lot in terms of mellowing out the room. Um, it wasn't a horrible room in terms of reverberance, but there was a little bit going on. So it was nice to have that there. Also, for the second blanket, um, Levi wanted to, um, in terms of sculpting the light a little bit, uh, what we ended up doing, we actually had originally set up a sort of a key light off to one side of Joel, and then we set up a, a black reflector or a negative fill on the other side to kind of create a little more contrast on his face. So kind of darken up one side while we're lighting the other side. And um, we weren't, he, Levi wasn't really getting the look he wanted with the reflector. And so what I proposed is, well, why don't we hang up this blanket? It's a bigger surface. Um, that'll serve double duty. It'll it'll capture some of the you know reverberance, and it will potentially give you a little bit more negative fill. So we ended up doing that, and it ended up working pretty well. Um, so we're pretty happy with that. And that was just barely out of the frame. I'm talking <laughs> um, literally just outside the frame. So it was pretty close to our talent, and uh, that was a nice. That ended up working up pretty nicely. Um, so what I did is I actually just boomed my good old Audio Technica AT forty fifty three B. Um, I brought a century, I actually brought a couple of century stands, three century stands, um, and I boomed my, um, you know, I've got a boom pole, carbon fiber boom pole, um, which actually you can see in the background right here. <laughs> um, so we, I just boomed that out. I've got a little attachment that um, we'll probably talk about at some point in the future that sits on top of the boom stand or the century stand. And it just sort of cradles the boom and holds it out just exactly where you need it. So that was really nice because then I could sit down with the mixer and actually um, kind of just keep a close eye on things and actually do some proper mixing. Not that it was required simply because, um, you know, it was just a simple interview, but um, it was nice to have that, that luxury of being able to sit down and focus on what was happening, um, pay 100% attention to what I was getting in terms of sound uh, through, through the mic and uh, making sure we were headed the right direction. It, as it turns out, it was very funny. Um, you know, it probably took about an hour to get things set up in terms of loading in all the gear. Um, one thing that we also had to contend with, which is more lighting related than sound related, but um, the kitchen doors, they had some French doors behind him that had these really kind of interesting yellow curtains on them uh, or golden curtains that really kind of warmed up the scene nicely. And it worked really well for what we were trying to do. But um, the problem was, is the sun was shining through them and it was, it was overwhelming. So one of the things that uh, Levi kind of sent me off to do, which was fun, <laughs> was um, he had a big scrim. So one of those, um, it's like a reflector, but it's even bigger. So it's like, I think it's six feet by four feet. Um, and uh, we took that out of its, uh, it, it actually has a reflective cover, just like a reflector, just a really big reflector really is what it is. So we took that outside with another sentry stand and I set it up in front of the window in hopes of just sort of dialing down the amount of light that was coming in. Um, what we found though, was that wasn't cutting it enough. So um, what we did is we actually took the cover for the reflector and we actually gaff taped that to the outside of the French doors and uh, really pretty much cut 100% of that light with the exception of a little bit at the bottom that was coming in through the bottom of the window, reflecting off the tile 
and illuminating the curtains nicely. So it was a very, very subtle, um, to the naked eye, it looked very subtle, but on the camera in the frame, it looked really, really nice. So that was kind of an interesting little experience there. Um, but once we finally sat down and started recording, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we were not, we were literally 15 seconds into the interview and I started picking up some really weird sound in my headphones and I was kind of freaking out like, what's going on? What's going on? I'm looking around. I'm looking at Levi. Um, he also brought along one of his friends to act as sort of a general production assistant and we're all looking around and actually Joel at one point stops talking. He goes, what is that sound? I have never heard that in my life before. <laughs> and it's a, you know, it's a Saturday morning. It's probably by this point, it's probably on 10 AM. And uh, when we came in, I noticed that there were some garage sales or kind of yard sales going on at a couple of the neighbor's houses. Um, so Levi asked the production assistant to go out and go figure out what the sound was. So he walked out and found out it was a kid who had, who was, you know, one of the kids of the families that was having a yard sale. And he had found some old um, self-inflating air horn thing. And he was, <laughs> he was shooting that thing off. And uh, so all it took was our, our production assistant just had to go out and say, hey, wondering if we could ask you a favor, um, if you could just kind of keep it quiet for the next few minutes, we're trying to film here. And that actually worked beautifully. The, 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 the family was happy to oblige and um, we didn't have any more issues with that sound. So sometimes the solution is you just need to find a way to make things quiet around the set. <laughs> and sometimes that's talking to the neighbors or whatever it's gonna take. Um, so that was pretty fortunate that that worked out. So we were able to redo that part of the interview and that everything went swimmingly from there. Um, it's amazing also how much a, um, a sensitive condenser microphone will pick up. <laughs> um, so of course, Joel's family was in and out, um, throughout the interview. And so there were, you know, there were a couple of times when they came in and we just sort of paused and that was no problem. Um, but then they went off into other rooms and started whispering that condenser mic can pick that up just as well. So <laughs> Joel was kind enough to handle the, the responsibility of asking them to not whisper for just a few more minutes. And so we were able to work that out as well. So a lot of times it's just really practical solutions. It's doing whatever you can to get, uh, you know, enough quiet for filming. Um, it also helps if you've got everything set. Um, oh yeah. A couple of other things, just like before there was an air conditioner running, actually a window kind of unit of air, air conditioner. Um, and, um, we had talked early on when we were just bringing the gear in and setting up and, you know, um, we said, Joel, Hey, Joel, is it okay if we turn that off while we're shooting? He's oh yeah, you can turn it off right now. And I, we were like, no, 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 we're gonna, <laughs> it was a very hot day. Um, so we left it on and then right before we started shooting, um, we turned that off. And then I also, uh, requested if we could, uh, unplug the refrigerator, there's a refrigerator up behind and off to the side a little bit. And they, they didn't have an issue with that, which was great. I also, um, I've probably talked about this before, so I apologize if I have, but if I haven't, um, one thing I like to do, and I learned this from a guy named Rick Beers, who wrote uh, a really interesting book called The Location Sound Bible. Um, he, he suggested put your car keys in the refrigerator if you do unplug it. That way, you won't forget to plug it back in. <laughs> so we did that. Um, I put my keys in the refrigerator um, and explained to them what I was doing, and, and they were all great with that. And so as soon as we were done shooting, first thing I did is I hopped up. Levi turned on the air conditioner. I went over to the fridge, and we got that plugged in, and everything settled and back to how it should be. So, um, you know, it's interesting when you're working at someone's home, you're trying to – Joel and his family were all very, very accommodating. It was great to work with them, but it can be a challenge sometimes, and you have to, you know, do your best not to – make an absolute disaster area of their home. I felt like maybe we were imposing a little heavily at some point, but um, again, they were very accommodating. We then went down to his, um, well, we did one shot. I Levi wanted to capture a shot of Joel walking down his basement stairs into the basement, into the workshop, and I get kind of a morning look to it. So um, we did some gaffing work. He, you know, he kind of directed me on how he wanted the lights set up, and we reflect, reflected a light off of the wall up at the top of the stairs. Um, to make it sort of a silhouette effect. So as Joel walked down, um, he was pretty much silhouetted. And uh, that took some kind of tweaking around. By the one of the things we got to do, which was very cool, was um, Levi and I are working together on a, well, we're, we're talking about putting together a course and we haven't done, we've done a little bit of planning, but we're not ready to start actually doing the production yet. But 
um, doing these these projects together, we're hoping to get enough material to put together a lighting course. And uh, yeah, as part of that, uh, Levi made some contacts. And in fact, I also talked to um, a guy at NAB this last April. Um, there's a company called, oh, what are they called now? <laughs> That's embarrassing. Uh, Hexalux. And uh, Hexalux uh, makes some very nice uh, LED Fresnel lights. And they're pretty, they're, they're, they're pricey. Um, for those of us that are working on no budget, they're definitely pricey, but they um, offered to sponsor us and they sent over a couple of LEDs um, and they are, they are a dream to work with. Absolute dream. And the reason they're a dream is that the output is really, there's a they're great output. Color quality is awesome. Um, they have, they're fully, um, you know, focusable. So you can, you can really dial in a spot um, or flood it. And um, you can also do something really unique is you can actually tilt the lens plane, which is cool because then if you're shooting at a wall, for example, at an angle, what will typically happen is where the light first hits the wall will be really intense and then it will sort of fade off. But you can actually tilt that lens plane so that you get an even wash of light across the entire wall. Very cool feature. And of course, it comes with um, attachments like soft boxes, so on and so forth. Um, so anyway. We got that dialed in. Um, that was an interesting one because as a sound guy, I got to stand with my boom pole <laughs> um, right over the, and, and kind of boom that up and over the banister and down the stairs, just barely out of frame. Um, so we could capture the the footsteps as he went down the stairs and get the kind of the creaking of the, the stairs and things of that nature. So that worked out nicely. And then the rest was in his workshop down in the basement. And there were all sorts of really very cool sounds. Um, of course, it, you, as you can imagine, if someone's making a guitar by hand, um, involved, um, you know, cutting wood, of course, and um, using a chisel to kind of work some of the wood down. Um, he actually picked up a bunch of, and we captured this as actually as wild sound. Um, actually, let me let me take a step back. I want to describe this one scene we shot. So one scene we shot as sort of an establishing scene for or clip for the. Um, coming into the workshop was there's this, he has several tables and one of the tables has a couple of the guitars that are kind of in progress. So the bodies of the guitars lined up and then he has a bunch of the component pieces sitting there. He has some, a back for another guitar sitting there and the front for another guitar sitting there. Um, a bunch of the tuners, which are the little, you know, the knobs, of course, they use to tune the guitar and uh, those have some metal and plastic. I don't know if it's plastic or whatever it is, but, um, so what we did as an establishing shot is we had Joel kind of cut, walk in and walk around the table and start picking up some of the guitar tuners as if he were picking them up to go actually, you know, do the next step and, and put them on the, the fretboard and, and the um, tuning head. And um, so it was a wide, the problem was it was a wide shot. So there wasn't really any great way that I could capture the sound of those tuners because they're, again, if they're metal as he's putting them in his hand, we're hearing the, the you know, kind of the clinking of the metal a great sound and uh, we couldn't film that so what we did is we actually shot that wide and then right on the spot there i essentially got foley um, or sound effects however you want to look at it um, and just had him pick some of those up we did a couple of different takes of that um, so i'm excited to, to see the final edit where um, the way it's going to work is levi's doing the edit and then he's going to send me an omf file from premiere which is essentially kind of a pre-rendered shot of the edit um a pre-rendered file of the edit including all of the cut information for the audio and then i layer in the actual quality high quality production audio that i shot and also do any of the kind of the sound design or the you know fitting in the foley pieces and fitting in all the sound effects because once we got downstairs <clears throat> into the workshop and this is for better or for worse i don't this is a this may be a lesson learned we'll see um, but while we were upstairs doing the interview, we slated everything. So we did probably six or eight takes of the with the interview. And each, at the start of each of those, we had a slate, and I slated it. Um, so we had that in point, and that's going to be really helpful. But then when we, once we got downstairs, um, Levi was saying, hey, don't worry about the slating. We can just go straight into these um, because, again, it's just sound effects. So it'll be interesting to see how that works in post. I think ideally <laughs> on the bigger pr productions, they would actually slate those as well. Um, we'll see if that comes back to bite us. So that could be a lesson learned. Um, let's see. 
there was something else I was thinking of um, that I wanted to. Oh, let me show you. I want to show you something here that probably will not come as a surprise to most of you, but for some of you, maybe it will. Um, whoops. I'm gonna... Sharing is not always the easiest thing here. Okay, here we go. Here's Audition. You should be seeing that now. So this is one of the files from the interview straight out of my recorder. In this case, I was using my Sound Devices 633. Um, and just so that you're aware, and this wasn't necessary in this case, um, but it, you know, it just recorded this way. Um, this, actually, the first two channels here are the stereo mix, and the third channel is the isolated track. So this is the actual, this bottom one here is the microphone, the single microphone. And technically, these are these two are the stereo mix. Now you can see I didn't really do anything special with the mixing. So when I came in to post process that, all I really did is extract this to mono files. So you can see here, it'll just split it up into three different files. And I would use the third one here, which was the the one direct the isolated track directly from the microphone. So you can see here the slate. Um, very distinctly. <laughs> so hopefully that'll make syncing a lot easier. In terms of time code, just um, just to kind of give you a little background on that. So I talked to Levi ahead of time and said, hey, we're in a position where we could do time code. He was shooting the visuals with a Sony A7S II. So I think a lot of you are probably familiar with that camera. It's a full frame mirrorless, uh, very small body camera. Um, it does have a microphone input. It's a 3.5 millimeter input. So technically we could have done um, time code using my um, tentacle sync or using my Mose gear and um, with the sound devices. Um, but he actually opted not to do that um, just because the one complication that I don't think we've really worked out well yet, and that is just to sync them up. When you, well, when you send time code to a camera as an audio track, when he starts playing those clips on his computer in Premiere, um, which is what he's going to edit in, He's going to have this blaring time code <laughs> and of course yes he could mute the track um and then the other channel would be whatever sound the tentacle sync captured in its tiny little tinny microphone which isn't bad but um wouldn't be awesome either um but the problem is is the software that takes that audio track and converts it into something that can be used as time code and then syncs it up to the audio is an app that you have to have the tentacle sync plugged into your computer as a USB dongle for that software to work. Um, so that's kind of the problem with it for our workflow right now. We kind of need to get past that and find a way to work around that. But I'd actually like to talk to the tentacle sync guys. I wish that weren't necessary <laughs> um, because it would make it a whole lot easier to work on things like this. And, and that works fine if you're the guy that shot the, uh, you know, shot the video, captured the audio, um, and you're going to do all the editing because, you know, you'll have everything. But if you have separate people doing that, it becomes a little bit of a pain unless I give my time code module to Levi to take home and use. Um, kind of kind of becomes a messy thing. So we opted not to shoot with time code. We just did slating. Just kind of give you the background on that. Um, the, the reason I wanted to show you this file here is that I think a lot of people, and in fact, I'll show it to you here. And let me just show you, if I run statistics on this, just to see where the loudness is sitting, the loudness is at minus 35.7. Um, and in a professional production, you can see the, the actually the loudest peak here is hitting about minus 12. Most of the rest of them are not. Um, when you're working with the professional recorders, this is pretty common. You can actually run it with this much overhead. Because when you go to, to normalize this and make it louder, um, you're not going to have to worry too much about noise. That's one of the beauties of working with some of these higher quality recorders. Um, could you do this with a Tascam DR60D or DR70D or something like that? Yeah. You probably need to push the game just a little bit more and leave yourself just a little bit less headroom um, just to keep the noise under control or be prepared to do a little noise reduction in post. Um, but with the sound devices, this is totally normal. and um, this is a this is a great way to work. Um, I know that when some people see this the first time, they're like, "Oh my gosh, this isn't very good audio. This is going to be a nightmare." <laughs> um, but it actually cleaned up nicely, and in fact, this is what the waveform looks like after I did the post processing on it. Um, and here I have it sitting just at I believe this is minus twenty four in terms of loudness right now. Yep, minus twenty four point five. 
um, once I get the full mix or the full edit from Levi, along with you know the OMF file and all the audio files, um, I'll be doing a little mixing. We're going to have a music bed, of course, some music sitting behind it. So um, I'll have to mix this. So I don't want this to be uh, all the way at the maximum loudness yet. I want to wait until I do the final mix, and then we'll take that to the maximum loudness or the loudness target, I should say, since this will be on the web and it will be a stereo output file at the end. The target will be minus 16 LUFS. So that's a little bit of background on there. I just wanted to show you that because I think that's of interest. And I've had people ask that kind of question before, like they'll get these this file in like this and they'll just kind of freak out thinking, oh my gosh, it sounds horrible. I can barely hear it, um, but that's perfectly normal. So there is uh, an example in Audition. All right. Um, so to finally get back to Kevin Steinman's uh, question, <laughs> that was the long way around. It's 25 minutes later. Uh, Kevin asked again, what's the difference in terms of sound for a narrative versus a documentary? Well, what I worked on this weekend um, was probably somewhere in terms of what we did on the set um, was probably somewhere in the middle. A lot of times documentaries um, on the extreme end get kind of crazy where you pretty much, in some cases, you just put a lava up on the people that you're going to be, you know, that they're following around with the camera and you just wish for the best. Um, and that's craziness. Um, and that's probably a lot of fun too, I imagine at some level. Um, but what I did, what we did was a little bit more, you know, the, the environment was pretty well controlled. I could do everything with a boom mic. Um, that made it a lot easier. So I would say with documentaries, you have to be just ready to do whatever the director wants to do. And oftentimes the director is is the cameraman as well, but her camera woman as well. But the the in those cases, they're in some cases they're running and gunning so much that they'll just put a shotgun microphone up on the camera and, and call it good. Other times they're running and gunning and they want a sound guy that can do his or her best to boom while they're just running and gunning. Um, I've seen a I actually saw a documentary and I'm trying to remember what it was. I didn't watch didn't get to watch the whole thing, but I saw the first few film, and I think it won a film festival award. Um, but I was astonished. I was watching it, and they had a scene out on a street where a guy—I um, don't remember the entire story—but I think a guy, someone had murdered a member of his family, and there was some evidence that he was going to pick up from the attorney. And for whatever reason, they just met out on the street, and the attorney gave it to him. <laughs> if I'm remembering this all right, maybe I'm not, but. Um, it was a kind of, you know, kind of a striking scene to really draw you into the, the film from the start. But what I noticed is as they as they walked down the street, there were several times where the boom mic dipped into the frame. <laughs> um, so they were actually booming live, I guess, um, instead of loving up the, the guy. I guess they wanted to capture whatever dialogue they could from the attorney who was also meeting them there who they didn't have access to ahead of time. So they wouldn't be able to love him up. Um, and so their approach was, let's just go boom it and do our best. And I remember as the scene faded out, <laughs> the boom is dipping way into the to the frame again. Um, and yet it still won an award. I don't don't ask me about that. I think we should strive for for better than that. But <laughs> um, so that that's the kind of the one extreme. Um, I think a lot of documentaries are shot with, with a lot of lavaliers. And in fact, I think it depends on the director these days, even on narrative films. Um, I was listening to another sound mixer who worked on um, Interstellar. And um, I'm trying to remember, I don't remember his name, to be honest. But uh, he was talking about how he'd worked for a couple of different big directors. And one of them hated lavalier microphones. And the other director, um, you know, he showed up the first day on set. <clears throat> And he was planning on just booming everyone because he was used to doing that working for the other director, which he had had for several years and several projects. And the new director was like, why aren't all these people lobbed up? Where are their wireless? Um, and so he had to run and kind of scramble and get everyone wired up because uh, some of the directors like to work that way. So um, I think really it it's all over the board. I would say that generally, if you, if you could make any generalization narrative, you're going to have a little bit more uh, time to plan in most cases. Um, you're going to do more pre-production work in theory, hopefully. <laughs> and 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 oftentimes the sound mixer on those cases will actually be, well, you know, on the big productions, of course, they have Video Village and Video Village also has a sound cart and the mixer is sitting at the sound cart and the boom operator is actually 
you know, 50 to 100 feet away, actually doing the booming. So um, that's a case where you have a lot more planning. And you probably, in, in many cases, you would lob them up and you would boom them both. Um, and again, it depends partly on the director. But I think that's a big difference with narrative is it oftentimes with a properly directed narrative, um, and we don't always, all of us don't have this luxury of working on these, and I've never worked on one of those yet uh, to that extent. But in theory, there's a lot more pro pre-production work and planning. And uh, so you kind of know what you're going to be doing going in. And I try to do that too. When I worked with Levi the last time, I said, hey, you know, what do I need to bring in terms of lav mics? You know, how many actors are in the piece? What's the general idea? So on and so forth. And and this time I went in being prepared to lav up, but I, I, you know, just having from the conversations we'd had, I knew it wasn't going to necessarily be a, a critical thing to, to use the lav necessarily. So um, we played it by ear and, and when we got there, we decided now things are looking pretty good. We can, we've got full access to boom. Let's just go with the boom. So that is what we did. All right. Well, I hope Kevin, that kind of answers your question. I know it was a long way around and it's not a very definitive answer, but uh, that's the way things work in the, in the real world, as we all know. So <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for joining today. It's uh, good to talk with you. And if you have any questions or comments or thoughts, go ahead and leave those down below on the Google Plus page. We'd love to hear from you. Hope everything, everyone's uh, having a good time capturing great audio, making some great recordings, and we'll talk to you all next week. Take care.